Hey everyone, I am ridiculously excited today and honored and grateful to have Sid Paquette here. Um, there are a number of reasons, but I, I really feel that it's uh, mostly because he brings so much wisdom and experience to this uh, topic. Um, he has been around this ecosystem uh, from the very early days. Um, his, his years at Omer's Ventures have really uh, imbued him with immense knowledge. He's, he's been through so many great companies from Hootsuite to League, and we're going to touch on all of those things. But it really is those rich experiences that he has from that era and, and helping build some of Canada's most successful startups. And now in his time of leadership, although it's been you know, reasonably brief at RBC, uh, we're going to touch on RBC and, and how uh, Sid and his team there are leading RBC, how they're you know, making decisions and, and what decisions might come um, you know, through this crisis, but also after this crisis. So you can imagine that this is going to be a very informative um, discussion. And please reach out and ask questions um, through the chat. I will be, I'll be asking a number of questions to start. Um, but then I really want to encourage all of you um, to throw your questions into the mix because this is really informative for you. So as, as I mentioned at the very beginning, Sid, you were at Omer's Ventures for a number of years. You really did um, have an impact on a number of phenomenal founders, great companies, um, some of the most incredible startups in Canadian history. What are some of your favorite memories from that experience? And that <coughs> Yeah, so so thanks, Joe. I, I mean, it's um, so it's tough to peg a favorite memory. I mean, I'll, I'll give you some context. You know, when I joined Omer's Ventures, I had the opportunity to work with both a very close friend and a mentor of mine, and John Ruffalo, to help build that practice out. You know, that was a phenomenal experience and opportunity, and, and something that I'll cherish forever. You know, you kind of move past that, and I'd say. You know, the thing that I probably, you know, looking back on and, you know, I think John would say the exact same thing. I think the thing that kind of sticks out the most to us is, you know, from a, and this wouldn't be one memory, this would be, you know, thousands of memories, is all of the work that we did with the CEOs and management teams that we invested in. And, you know, through good times and bad, working with them to come up with solutions to problems that they were facing that was ultimately, you know, where some of the strongest friendships got built. Um, and that would be certainly, you know, another, you know, another group of amazing memories uh, for me personally. And then I think the third group of amazing memories is really going to be around the team that we built. Right. And so, you know, again, you know, the number of individuals that I am so closely connected with by virtue of Omer's ventures is amazing. Um, you know, both folks that are, that are currently there and folks that have left. And so that part of it is something that I'll cherish forever. And, um, you know, really, you know, I, uh, I look back with um, very fond memories on all of those. So tough to peg a particular memory, um, but those would be three buckets of amazing, amazing things that I've had the opportunity to experience. As you were talking, I was thinking about some of the incredible um, leaders that you've been able to get behind and invest in. What are some of the characteristics of the great startup founders that you've been associated with? What are two or three of those characteristics that you identify are consistent in those people? So some of the people on this call can say, you know what, I, I think there's more of me that I could be showing people. Yeah. So, um, Great question. And this is something that it took a long time to learn. And so to the extent that I can help impart any of my experience to help others, you know, I'd love to do that. I would say of all the amazing leaders that I've worked with, they've all had a couple of characteristics in common. Uh, a lot of things not in common, but a couple in common. One is, you know, endless creativity, right? And so people think that, you know, successful startups you know, it's up and to the right for these businesses. It absolutely is not up and to the right for any of these organizations. So if you're lucky, you know, it, it goes like this and it trends up and to the right, but there is always, um, you know, mountains and valleys that you have to, that you have to cross. And so, 
you know, again, endless creativity allows these organizations and these entrepreneurs and these management teams to deal with all of the issues that they're gonna need invariably to deal with in order to make a successful company. The second one, which is, which is tougher to pin, but I've, I've got a sense as to what it is, is gonna be what people would, would, would refer to as coachability. And so what does that mean? You know, I've had the fortune to work with entrepreneurs who have had a ton of success historically and have all the right in the world to say, hey, I got it, I know what I'm doing, uh, just leave me alone, and, you know, I've done this before. And so I've had the opportunity to work with them. And what I would say is, you know, for all of those individuals, the amazing piece about all of them was the coachability factor. And, and really what that was is it, it wasn't that they did what I wanted them to do, because if they did that every time, then I should be the CEO, not them. But what they did and what was amazing is they always took, you know, respected advice under advisement every single time as they went to make their decisions. And so they, you know, had all the right in the world to say, I've done this before, I know what I'm doing, you know, I'll get back to you with the result. But invariably, none of them did. And I would say that is really the characteristics, you know, those two characteristics, creativity to deal with issues you know, and with creativity, you know, you've, there's got to be perseverance and, and we know all that. But then that coachability factor is a really big piece. So when you're going through a gut wrenching time like this, where we have both a financial crisis and a global pandemic, and there are so many things that you can control, but many things that are out of your control. Uh, what advice do you give to a founder who's got a business that's either I don't know, 12 months old or four years old. What, what are you telling them? How are you coaching them in, in, in an environment like this? Yeah. So, you know, maybe I'll, maybe I'll start, Joe, by telling you what keeps me up at night, to be honest. And so what keeps me up at night, so, you know, all of, and we're talking about tech right now. So all of the tech companies that are, you know, out right now are in survival mode, trying to right size their businesses. Um, and so, you know, by virtue of that, there's a lot of headcount reduction. And in a lot of cases, absolutely necessary. What keeps me up at night is that, you know, in some cases, we may be cutting to the bone. And my fear is to build the muscle back up around that bone when we get out on the other side of COVID absolutely will delay these businesses getting back to a pre-COVID state in some cases by years, right? And so that is my biggest fear. And so what I've encouraged people to do, you know, all of the CEOs that I work with and the management teams is just really to think creatively about, you know, what can you do from a human capital perspective so that you don't have to cut to the bone, right? And there's a lot of things that you're seeing in the market that are really interesting because what you want to do is get out on the other side of COVID and you wanna be able to actually escalate your business again. And in order to do that, you need to have top talent and you can't then be back in the market trying to recruit, recoup the top talent that you ultimately uh, cut in advance. And so, you know, while a lot of it is necessary, you know, I do encourage people to just get creative in terms of some of the solutions that they're looking at, because that's really what keeps me up at night. So I was fortunate enough to post a CFO panel the other day and some of the ideas were going to a four day work week, uh, you know, taking mandatory vacation days that are unpaid, um, changing, uh, giving people the opportunity to opt out of near term comp for long term comp. Are there other ideas that you've seen or heard that maybe should be considered as, as a founder is going through this time without cutting to the bone? Because you're yeah. absolutely right. You want to accelerate out of this bad period into the good period. Yeah. So, um, you know, and again, it, it's easier to cut people as kind of being that first, that first line of defense in terms of trying to right size your business. There's a lot of things that are being done in the market. And, you know, again, some creative things that are being done, you know, we've seen, you know, and this is pretty standard now, you know, executives taking pay cuts, you know, the one thing that I've encouraged, you know, all the organizations that I work with is actually have the open communication with your teams and not just your executive teams, have it with the entire company because you'd be amazed at what, you know, collectively people will come up with as potential solutions. And so I've seen everything from, I've seen salespeople put up their hands and go, you know what, you know, take all my commissions this year. I actually don't want any. 
I will deal with the base and it, you know, that'll help right size. I've seen all sorts of amazing things happen. So I encourage folks to have that open line of communication because I think at the end of the day, nobody wants to be without a job during this period of time. It's a very challenging time for everybody, very stressful. And so I think, you know, not only do they not want to be without a job, but they also don't want to see their colleagues out of a job as well, which is almost as stressful as themselves being out of a job. And so talk to your staff, talk to your team and come up with some creative solutions. So some things that I've seen, you know, to your point, I've seen the four day work week, you know, I've seen the executive pay cuts. For folks that have talked to their whole teams, I've seen entire organizations go, you know what, I will actually take a pay cut, you know, as, you know, a non-exec member, you know, to help the company. And I think all of those things are great. Um, you know, I've seen people, you know, ultimately look at topping up with equity, which is pretty standard at the executive level. I've seen some of those discussions, you know, within an entire uh, company as well to compensate people for, for the financial impact that they're, that they're, um, that they're taking by, by taking a pay cut. I've seen, um, you know, again, um, uh, I've seen organizations reach out to suppliers, right? And ultimately, you know, the pay cuts come because the revenue is not coming in the door. But what I've seen is some of your suppliers, you know, they may have, you know, 90 day payment terms with your organization. Um, you know, I've seen some of them prepay, right? So zero is absolutely doing this. And so don't hesitate to reach out to your suppliers, reach out to your landlords and ask for some sort of, of, um, of leeway in terms of what you can do just so that, you know, less capital is going out the door and then it ultimately helps you, um, you know, bring that capital back in. And then when you're dealing with your team, as you take a look as, you know, maybe this is, you know, sales teams that aren't taking, uh, commissions or what have you. I mean, there's a lot of things that you can do and this becomes really a mathematical exercise. So it's hard to say that this has unilateral application, but definitely do the modeling and see what that looks like. Um, because again, you know, you could reimburse some of those costs, you know, some of those, um, salary cuts in the future, right? Maybe it's deferred one or two years, but, but you could always offer that. Right. But again, that becomes, you know, again, a modeling exercise and, and something that I encourage people to do because, Again, once you start factoring in recruitment costs, the time in market, the time to ramp up new employees post COVID, you factor in all of those costs and then factor that into the runway of the organization. I got to believe that in a lot of cases, you're going to be far better off coming up with one of these innovative solutions than you are going to be cutting to the bone. Brilliant. I mean, <clears throat> I, I, I really, really, at the outset, you talked about having openness and transparency with your total team, not just the leadership team, because people do want to, A, have the opportunity and the right to have a, a say or an opinion. And some of those brilliant ideas, some of those selfless thoughts come from your team. And, and once you are coming out the other side of this, um, this correction or this recession or however you want to characterize it, they feel stronger about the decisions that they've made because they were included. They feel stronger about the company. They feel more loyal. And I think those are all really, really good points. I also like the creativity on deferrals because a lot of times people are just, let's just hack away, cut away. Let's just you know, do whatever it takes. But sometimes it takes more finesse than that. Sometimes it comes back to your comment about creativity. Going to those suppliers, I mean, this, this time around it's different because the government's, you know, talking to the landlord on your behalf or giving them a big chunk of, of capital. But, you know, having those creative discussions saying, listen, I need three months, I need six months, how can we work together? And when you have that honest and transparent dialogue, I find people are very helpful. Which yeah. leads me to my next point. What about the conversation with, you know, VCs? How should... Um, you know, any stakeholder, uh, but how should a founder be thinking about the relationship they have with their key stakeholders, with venture capitalists, and, and how much openness, how much and how frequent should that communication be uh, with those key relationships? Yeah, so I think, I think, again, here, transparency is going to be key. And I think, you know, everybody's talked about, you know, potentially that there's going to be a reduction in the amount of venture capital in the market. And, you know, there's some doomsday um, predictions out there. The reality is today, 
We have not seen a decrease in valuations as a result of COVID, neither in the US nor in Canada. And so I've got companies um, that I'm involved with that are absolutely, I've got a company that, that literally is, is raising and, and will conclude the raise during the COVID period at no discount from a valuation perspective to what they would have otherwise got in pre-COVID. Then I've got another one that is literally, you know, they can't pick up the phone fast enough for all the inbounds that they're getting. And so at the end of the day, there will be a flight to quality over time. Uh, valuations are not impacted as of yet. But what I will say, it is challenging virtually to connect for the first time with VCs. I think you can do it. I'd encourage people to do it. I would just put, um, you know, again, I'd be a little critical in terms of uh, the reality of actually turning something like that in into a, you know, a full blown uh, investment cycle, you know, if you've never met before. But if you've been a, a tech company, and, and I think most VCs encourage all of their companies to do this, there's probably dozens of VCs that you've already been connected with. So they already know who Joe is. They've already met you. They already like your company. Maybe you had to do some other things. Definitely reach out to all of those individuals because they don't need to meet you face to face anymore. Now they're getting updates. I encourage all of the companies to do that. And again, there is a flight to quality. So ultimately, you know, if you're a company that can demonstrate that you can manage the expense side of the equation, uh, you know, you are going to look more attractive, particularly if you're in an attractive space that people expect to kind of come out on the other side of COVID, probably in even better condition than what they were going in. You will likely raise capital, but capital is in the market. It hasn't gone anywhere. The VC funds that have raised have that capital. They will continue to deploy that capital. Now they are absolutely focused on their, their current portfolios for sure. Um, but ultimately they're all looking for new deals, right? And so, you're seeing organizations raising capital and making announcements during COVID because new deals are happening, right? And so I think, you know, keep that in mind that the world hasn't, hasn't gone uh, totally crazy as it pertains to that. So have transparency. Also recognize that unlike 2008, COVID has impacted everybody, right? So this isn't you know, you're not necessarily looking bad vis-a-vis -vis your competitors or bad vis-a-vis, -vis, you know, somebody else, like everybody's been decimated, right? Everybody is taking a hit here. And so, you know, keep that in mind because really that's actually part of the opportunity now, because if you can demonstrate that you've got good expense management, you can actually do remote sales and a lot of tech companies can, you're actually going to look even better now in this COVID period where, potentially your competitor took a bigger hit than you, than you would have pre-COVID. And, and so a lot of companies have actually flourished during this period as a result. And there's money out there. I mean, one money. Of, it's so Absolutely. different. I mean, you look at Georgian's most recent raise, Radical's raise, yep. your old shop just, you know, made yep. big, it's luge, uh, garage, uh, golden. There's a, there's a ton of money and they are looking. I, I, I agree with you. I think it's going to go to where you already have a pre-existing relationship, where there's a warmth, where there's a knowledge and understanding, a trust, a bond, um, but it doesn't preclude you from starting exactly. uh, new relationships. And and when I when I think about you know some of the um, things that you were talking about, can you the one thing that people aren't focusing on, they're focusing on you know cost cutting, but what about creative revenue generation ideas? Like when I think about you know some of the companies that you're associated with, like. Yeah. Um, League and, and Clue and Xanadu and whatnot, all in various stages of their um, life cycle. Can you, have you seen any really creative revenue producing ideas? Yeah, so you know what's interesting? So, um, so I do think people are thinking creatively about revenue, um, but what I've actually found, and I've got a couple examples of this, is, you know, again, everybody wanted to help during COVID. So tech companies were no different. And so this all came from a very altruistic place. So as an example, you know, you mentioned League. We'll talk about them for a minute. So League actually, you know, they've got a platform, sells to big enterprise, you know, it's a, you know, and they've done that for a while. When COVID struck, they actually had to create a, you know, and they call their platform HBX and they had to create HBX now. And what they had done, which they had never done before, to actually help other organizations, you know, address COVID and ultimately succeed is they actually for the first time did a trial, right? A free trial, 90 day free trial. And so they were very public about this. 
they did it, but again, for very altruistic reasons. Turns out, and again, they're in the healthcare space, so they're, they're gonna probably weather COVID a little bit better than, than some others that, that are maybe gonna be more directly impacted by COVID. But you know, that sort of behavior, you know, although it was altruistic, has paid dividends, right? Because you know, lots of organizations took them up on that. And so just even from a, from a pipeline management perspective, very, very good for the company, uh, despite that not being the intention, right? And then they've come out also and they've, you know, now created data analytics to help organizations manage the, you know, get back to, get back to the new normal, right? And again, it wasn't created with revenue in mind, um, but ultimately the take up on these solutions is phenomenal. And so that is actually going to turn into really good, ultimately revenue generating opportunities. Another example, uh, which was, again, not designed with revenue in mind, it was designed quite, you know, similar to League, you know, very altruistically is Vidyard, right? So Vidyard has never before offered its, its video solution to educators and boards and students, et cetera. Well, that's what it did. And it did it to kind of help everybody through this period because we're all, we're all interfacing through video so why not create the solution and package it up so that people can use it? And they did that and they gave it to the educators for free. Well, you know, again, you know, I haven't talked to the guys about this, but, but ultimately that's going to benefit them multiple years down the road. And, and it wasn't designed this way. They were doing it to help students kind of cope with online learning and the educators as they're dealing with online learning and they gave this solution to them for free. Well, if you kind of think out, you know, five years from now, all of a sudden you've created a base of, you know, students who are now going to be business leaders who use that product and ultimately are going to want to use that product in their, in their business environment. And so, you know, some of these altruistic um, actions are ultimately going to lead to revenue generating opportunities, maybe not immediately uh, because they weren't designed for that, but definitely in the long term. So again, encourage people to think about different markets, different targets, et cetera, um, because, you know, as long as you've got a long-term vision, some of these things will actually probably work out pretty well. Yeah, and those are great leaders, right? Mike Servinas, Mike Litt, these guys yeah. are great guys, very focused on the long game, not worried so much about the short game. Uh, very impressive. And speaking of great leadership, you've just joined an organization, RBC, who have been wonderful, wonderful uh, supporters of ours. Um, I've gotten to know uh, Dave uh, a little bit. Um, he's got a very strong science background from Waterloo. Then he went to Ivy, did his MBA. Talk to me a bit about leadership and, and what you've seen, um, you know, imbued, like with the Dave and how he's representing RBC uh, as a leader, but also representing them with the government and representing the country. It's, it's pretty, it's pretty impressive. Talk yeah, to you totally. And so, uh, so I do have a unique perspective on that because I, I started my first day at RBC was March 2nd. I think I was in the office for two weeks before we we're at a work from home situation. So, uh, you know, and again, for anybody who's had the opportunity to uh, move roles, shift jobs, there's always an element of, did I make the right decision? Did I do the right thing? Certainly in early days, happens to everybody every single time. I can honestly tell you, I could not be happier with the organization that I have joined. And so coming in at that time and just seeing the level of commitment to helping people, honestly, uh, from the inside within this organization has been remarkable. So the amount of work that people have put in to you know, help get the government money into the hands of you know, companies as quickly as possible. And, and some of the things like we've literally had to move mountains internally, you know, just to even get to a, you know, work from home situation, right? And so seeing all of this stuff internally, I actually could not be prouder of the organization. And I actually have zero buyer's remorse, to be honest. And, you know, again, the, the stuff that they've done that, again, you know, organizations typically would not come from the outside of seeing, it's been nothing short of, of remarkable. And then, you know, the leadership and the commitment from guys like Dave, and it's not just Dave, it's like Neil McLaughlin and Mike Dobbins and Greg Grice, like there's all these individuals that, 
you know, publicly have been absolute um, stalwarts and, and leaders. Um, you know, as an example, Dave coming out very early during COVID and, and reassuring every employee, every, you know, employee, you know, the 85,000 plus employees at RBC has that nobody will lose their job as a result of COVID in 2020. Like you can't imagine what kind of pressure that would relieve uh, or relieve off of people in the field that, you know, maybe just don't have the same visibility as the executive. So to take that sort of a leadership stance and focus on that and then focus on ultimately just trying to help the organizations, uh, it's been nothing short of remarkable. And, and, and for me, my integration has been really quick. Uh, I mean, it, it's, it's had to be. And so just, you know, being involved in discussions with government to help reframe some of these stimulus packages to make them more beneficial to, you know, the average individual, you know, the average company in the market. Um, you know, we were definitely at the forefront of some of those negotiations. And so that's been great to see as well, to see that leadership internally. So it's been good. I mean, just on talent alone, the fact that you were, were able to assuage those fears, um, there are a lot of companies out there, our whole community, right? This is, this is cannabis time. This is a very, this is a golden age for innovation and startups and, and rock star talent in Canada. I've, I've been impressed by people like TechTO uh, and, and others who've been stepping up and really trying to convey really powerful and important messages to retain talent in Canada and, and, and keep ca talent in their companies. Can you talk about um, talent acquisition in a time like this or talent retention? I mean, there are some great businesses out there, uh, Marianne Bulger with Prospect and uh, Helpless. Can you talk a little bit about talent and talent retention in a crisis? Yeah, so I think, I think again, that like all of those organizations, A, I think it's fantastic. Uh, you, know, I, you know, I saw a lot of the spreadsheets that were getting built in the early days of COVID. And so it's great that, you know, Marianne and others are able to pull that together into a cohesive solution that ultimately, you know, again, we're all in it together. So this is where this is very different from 2008. And this isn't, you know, only some of us are impacted, all of us are impacted. And so, you know, and again, people are good at their heart, right? And we're all going through the same thing. So we all see the same pain and we all want to help. So I think all of those solutions are great. I think, again, you know, we got to get creative on, you know, trying to reduce, you know, the size of those lists, quite frankly, um, because, you know, the startup on the other side, it's going to be challenging and we are losing jobs. And so we've got to think through that process a bit more. We've got to, you know, again, whether it's, you know, additional government stimulus, what have you, we've got to, we've got to bolster companies so that those lists don't continue to grow. Right. And, and, and literally that, that is what keeps me up at night. Um, but I love what they've done. And the tech community in particular is a very close, well-knit community, right? Like we all know each other or we're probably within two degrees of knowing somebody, not six. And that is remarkable. And people are stepping up to help, right? And again, very altruistic, you know, helping your, your colleague that unfortunately was, you know, subject to a cut or, you know, helping somebody else, you know, get a job. Like we're all doing that. And um, you know, I hope that that continues and, and within tech, it absolutely will because we've seen this happen before because the tech community is extremely tight. So I'm a huge supporter of what's happening and I, I think it's fantastic. I do think we've got to tech work on bolstering the organization so that we can reduce the flow and quite frankly, flatten, flatten the curve as it pertains to um, unemployment in the tech world in Canada. Awesome. Yeah. And, and, and I'm, I'm, again, I'm with you. I want so badly for this ecosystem to continue to foster growth and to flourish and, and to survive this period um, in the strongest possible way and become a magnet for even more talent to come into the marketplace because it's needed. And I've had a lot of calls recently about, can you refer somebody for this? Can you refer me to somebody for that? And it makes me really, really happy when I can make that relationship happen. So it sounds like it's the same for you. The other thing that I'm hearing is we've had a lot of companies that are in the B2B space and they're trying desperately. They're trying to get into the healthcare system and, 
and, and, and Dante is doing a great job with can help there. They're trying to get into the insurance companies. They're trying to get into the telcos. If I'm a B2B player, if I'm a um, Senso or Flybits and I'm trying to have greater access to more players, what's, what's the advice that you would give um, a founder that's trying to have a bigger impact in a B2B uh, setting? Yeah. And then you're talking about during COVID in particular, right? Yeah. Yeah, I mean it's it's um, it's definitely challenging, right? Like I'm not gonna I'm not gonna sugarcoat it. Like if I if I look at the financial institutions and you're looking at selling services to the financial institutions, you know during this period it's going to be tough. And, and the reason it's tough, it's not that that we don't care or that you know the insurance company doesn't you know isn't interested in your product. It actually has nothing to do with that. It has everything to do with you know, there's been so much change and there's honestly the focus of a lot of the organizations is, you know, helping people as much as they can. And it's, it's taken some of the focus off of, you know, do I really need that new product right now? And because that's not really where the focus area is, right? Like I, like I can tell you just speaking, you know, for our organization, you know, and what I've seen, we are unilaterally focused on helping our clients, and you know companies in the market survive covid and and everybody is focused on driving to that initiative and we only have a limited number of people internally and the stuff that we've had to do everybody's working around the clock to try to make that happen and so then to actually turn your mind to you know buying you know the next you know erp solution or crm solution like it's just it, it's not something that's a priority right now from our perspective in terms of as a buyer that will change over time. So I think you got to continue to have those discussions, but you know, I encourage people to, you know, if you're, if you're not getting a response right now, it's not because necessarily nobody's interested in what you're selling. It's just literally nobody has time to take a look at it because we're so much focused on some other things. Right. And so that will shift over time. And um, again, it's, it's, you just have to be cognizant of that, right? Like that, that would be my only comment on that front. And so post COVID, <clears throat> one of the things I was very fortunate to be part of uh, a C100 discussion a few months ago down in San Francisco. And one of the topics of discussion was if Canada, like the United States, wanted to generate as more unicorns, I mean, we, we seem to have one at a time. How do we get to 21? And the comment that came out, and it was, it was brilliant and really well backed up with great uh, information and, and stats to support it was we need more large Canadian companies to start to build relationships with those small and medium sized businesses um, who have great technology, great leadership, great teams. How do we get um, large cap Canada to start thinking about supporting the innovation culture in these great companies? Yeah, so I think, I think actually, you know, Canada actually does a not bad job of this. So if you look at our organization, you know, we've got, you know, RBC Capital Partners, we've got, you know, RBC Ventures, which is doing a lot of that sort of stuff. Our platform will, will do that as well. Um, once we've got this built out, you've got TELUS and, you know, they're, they're building out, you know, you know, they've got TELUS Ventures, they've been supporting a lot. They've built up an amazing uh, healthcare organization. So you've got a lot of those corporates doing that. Some of the other banks are doing some of the other things. You know, Sun Life has a labs, as do some of the other insurers. So I think they do. I mean, it's not going to benefit everybody. And, and, and I don't think they'll ever be meant to do that. Um, you know, I actually don't think it's the corporates actually that are going to drive unicorns in Canada, to be honest. I actually think um, we need to have more Shopify's that ultimately spin out with, with the teams to do some other things, right? Because I think we just need more experienced, you know, senior leadership in Canada to actually make this work. And if you look at us vis-a-vis -vis the U.S., that's really one of the big differences. And that's why, like, you know, a lot of, you know, high-flying Canadian companies end up recruiting certain roles out of the U.S. because we just don't have that talent here yet that's going to take some time to build out. And that's not something that's going to happen overnight. Um, but it is something that will happen over time, not to the same degree as the U S but, but hopefully it continues building out. So I actually think it's less of the corporates. I think, you know, where we could help as well is, 
you know, better procurement through, through our, through our government agencies. Right. So, yeah. you know, yeah, should yeah, yeah. we be doing better procurement with local tech companies? Absolutely. Can we do that? Absolutely. You know, have we done a great job of that? Absolutely not. So I like, there's things like that, that we can do. Um, and again, the government's, you know, they're making strides in, in that regard. Um, we've got a long way to go and, and, you know, but it, it is comforting that, that there is some movement. Um, so that would be my, my high level view on kind of the, 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 you know, the playing field with corporates. Yeah, I, listen, I agree. And I agree. I, I agree with your, uh, um, government at all three levels to start, you know, taking a stronger focus on Canada. And that, I think you've answered Ray Simonson's question about, uh, creating more unicorns and, and, uh, um, what else here? I meant Silicon Valley and Comerica. Um, also trying to deal with the Canadian government is, is way too hard for most of us. Any advice on, on how to penetrate either provincial, federal, or municipal levels of government? So, so it's, not, it's not easy. And, and the nice thing is, you know, this got created a number of years ago. Um, and this was an initiative, you know, started by uh, Jim Balsilli, John Ruffalo, you know, spun out of an Omer's event is the uh, Council of Canadian Innovators, right? So I encourage tech companies, you know, we never really had a, an independent lobbying agency on behalf of Canadian tech ever before, before the council. And so I think, you know, if there's only so much that they can do as well, but they are a really good lobbying agency and lobbying uh, body. They are independent and they are focused on technology. This isn't this isn't run by a bunch of service providers. This is run by entrepreneurs who buy in and ultimately are pushing forward the agenda that's relevant to entrepreneurs. Again, you know, that, that council has grown significantly over the years um, and they've done some really, really amazing work. So really proud of what they've done. And it's been really helpful for Canadian technology. So, you know, again, you know, we're going to do similar stuff, you know, at the financial institutions, um, certainly the ones that are focused on tech in terms of driving forward those agendas. Um, but that would be one alternative, I would say. That would be interesting. Perfect. Uh, question from uh, Gail Masters. How do you create a balance or at least manage the perception when your goal of finding opportunities and growing your business seems in conflict with helping people and businesses during this time? Yeah, I guess is that a question – directed towards our institution or, or in general? I think it's in general. Okay. I'm not sure I fully comprehend. Um, are you able to? Uh, let me just. Uh... Hi, it's Gail. Oh, hey, Gail. Hi, how's it going? Go ahead, fire off, fire away. Uh, well, I'm in sales and I know I, I heard at the very beginning we had some of the conversations around at this time helping people and giving up your salaries and giving up your commission, <laughs> which is hard for me to swallow. But at the same time, uh, part of what, what I do, I work for LTI and, and RBC is actually a client of ours and actually I'm a client of RBC. So kind of comes full circle. I, sat, I started sitting in on sales meetings. We went immediately all work from home and digital. And the conversation was immediately, how do we retain our revenue? How do we keep our clients happy? How do we help them understand where we can help them now? And from the help them perspective, if you're a salesperson, they look at you and go, oh, you're just trying to sell me something. And you're one of a million people that are spamming my email right now. So it's like, it's always a balance between I'm selling you something that I know you need and I know you need it right now. And I don't want you to treat me as a salesperson, but yeah. you need my help. So that, it's not really a sales pitch. It's just for me, it's a conflict all the time between selling and doing the right thing. And when I believe that doing the right thing and selling is one and the same, not everyone agrees. Yeah. And Gail, just a, just a question for you. So I, I don't disagree with you. A question back to you, uh, since you're a sales leader and, and, and you're focused on this 24, or seven. You know, the one thing the work from home has, you know, certainly I've experienced, I think most of my colleagues have experienced it is we're all working probably harder now than we ever did before. And, and it's like Groundhog Day, right? Like every day, like I have no idea what day it is. It could be Saturday or it could be Wednesday. Um, 
And so again, that, there's an issue there around work-life balance, but I guess my, my question back to you was, do you find it at all easier during COVID to get some time with people? Because, you know, we've cut out all of commuting time. And so literally I think we're working harder because we can fit more into the day now. Are you finding it any easier on your side? Like, do you find you're Absolutely. getting, you're able to get better access now than you otherwise could have because it's easier to get a video call with me than it is to take me out for a lunch for two hours or something, you know, or, exactly. or get a, a one hour meeting. Okay. Exactly. You're right. I, I've had more face to faces since I've been at home than I had in the last year. Right. Because to right. your point, when, when you're a salesperson, they, they think you're trying to sell them something, but if you just want to have a conversation, see how things are going, there's not necessarily anything to sell. It's just ma maintaining relationships and understanding what everybody's doing. And I, I say this to my daughter all the time, we're all living the exact same life right now. It's, it's yeah. kind of scary when you think about it, but these Zoom meetings are happening in all different industries across the world and everybody's living the same life. My daughter, my son actually said, what time is it? What day is it? I don't even know. And I'm like, well, we just ate breakfast. So all you have to worry about is when we're eating lunch. <laughs> but I care about what day of the week it is. And I care if it's five o'clock because I want to switch from working at home in my basement to yeah. going upstairs and being part of the family. So okay. yeah, no, no, it makes sense. Yeah, I just wanted to ask because I know that's how I'm experiencing it. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Gail. We're probably all watching Fallon and Ellen and we're all doing the same things. Thank you. Um, got a question from Saroop Barwani. Uh, Dave and Neil have publicly spoken about the roadmap to build the future uh, bank over the next decade. Um, does RBC expect to change for good with respect to consumer and small business behavior as a result of COVID-19? Yeah, so I guess my one comment I would say is, is nothing is changing as a result of COVID-19. So, um, so certainly the bank is uh, thinking technology forward because I wouldn't be here if it, if it weren't. And so, you know, the platform that we're building and the commitment that we're making to the technology community, this is not something where, um, you know, we're only going to dip our toe in this for a period of time and then, you know, you won't see RBC involved. So there is an absolute commitment all the way to the top of the house. And um, we will be very much focused on technology and building out the right product suites and the right platforms to service everybody. Yeah. A uh, question from Guelph, Mickey Campo, innovation solutions might result in new technology, but innovation doesn't equal technology. Can you speak to the current situation or future trend on investing in non-traditional tech companies, i.e. food, ag, uh, general small business, advanced manufacturing? Yeah, okay, G uh, good question. I'm not sure how to answer that uh, specifically. I think um, definitely all of those areas are very interesting. And I, like I can tell you, again, just even within our organization, you know, we've got individuals dedicated to a lot of those areas already. Um, so it's definitely areas that we're focused on. And so, you know, that's probably the best comment I can give you is just based on what I'm seeing, you know, since I've joined, um, you know, less than less than two months ago. Um, but so definitely we're looking at it. It's an area that I looked at um, when I was a VC, a number of those areas, and, and we will continue to look at those and build out competencies in those spaces. Beautiful. Christy Amen would like to know, angels will become more risk adverse. Uh, we're gaining traction and showing excitement in our platform. How can we de-risk our opportunity in conversation with angels? Yeah, so uh, so I used to be an angel investor as well. And, and um, again, it, it kind of ebbs and flows. And I think it depends on the angels you talk to. Some are more risk averse than others. And, you know, I think, you know, to the extent that you can show and demonstrate multiple channels or paths to revenue. I think that is going to help most angel investors as they evaluate the opportunity. I think if you have one path to revenue, you probably, you're, you're a higher risk organization, but if you've got alternative paths to revenue, I think then that's going to, that's going to give people a lot more comfort. And, and again, you gotta, you gotta balance this off between having too many. You don't want to say that you are the Uber of everything. Um, because you probably won't be successful. But what you want to do is, uh, you know, show that, hey, I've got this one path that we're following, but 
just so you know, we're also exploring a couple of these other paths, which again, if this one doesn't work, we've got B and C as well that, you know, we think are viable opportunities to drive revenue and build it and build a bigger company. Terrific. Um, San Lee, in general, is there a standard path to doing an IPO, either through the TSX or uh, NASDAQ? Uh, so no, so there's not a standard path. Um, so there's a number of ways to do an IPO. There's a number of uh, definitions for what an IPO is. I'd say most uh, VCs in Canada, when they think IPO, they're thinking, uh, you know, what I would call big board IPOs. So in Canada, that's going to be TSX. In the U.S., um, you know, that's going to be something, you know, akin to NASDAQ or the New York Stock Exchange. Um, but again, there's, you know, over the counter, there's all these other, there's the ventures exchanges, there's a whole bunch of different ways. And so it depends on how you characterize IPO, really. But uh, there's a number of paths to get there, structurally um, and, uh, and tactically. And some terrific investment bankers at uh, RBC that might be able to help them out. Yes, we absolutely have. <laughs> um, Lauren D'Souza, do you think angel investors will be less open to new investments post-COVID? Uh, good question. Um, again, it, it's tough to say. Uh, you know, so angel investors tend to be individuals and family offices, which are different than VCs, which have a fund. And so... It's easier for me to comment on the VCs because the capital is raised and the capital is available so you, and the capital needs to be deployed. With angels, it's very different because you typically aren't doing it in a fund, um, you know, absent uh, kind of what Archangel's doing and a few others. But um, so it is a little different if it's not in a fund. And, and then ultimately, it's down to the particular, you know, risk aversion for the angels that, that are involved or, or the family offices that are involved. And if it's at all helpful as an angel investor in many companies like Wealthsimple, Coho Financial, uh, Kids and Company, Savvy, um, I, I would concur. I would say that I uh, continue to look at opportunities. I continue to support existing um, you know, positions in my portfolio. And uh, once we get through um, adjusting the weighting um, in, in how I'm allocating capital. Um, I, I'm, I'm going to be just as enthusiastic and just as courageous, if you will, um, when I find great ideas despite this, because I see this as temporary. You know, whether this is six weeks or six months or 16 months, it's probably one of those three and coming out the other side. And as a veteran of eight uh, significant crises as an asset manager and as a, an angel and, and CEO, um, I always try to position for what's to come and I get very excited about accelerating out of a downturn as opposed to letting it debilitate me. Okay, so uh, Mohan uh, Salehi, should we be more concerned about a vast majority of Canadian startups going to the States to get funding during this crisis and the lasting repercussions that might have, uh, this might have on a startup ecosystem? Yeah, so, so I actually don't think so, because I think the U.S. is going through the exact same thing that we're going through. So, again, this isn't a, a geographically defined issue that we're going through. So I actually don't think you're better off going to the U.S. than you would in Canada. And I think, and again, we're all in this together. So um, everybody's going through the same thing. There is a flight to quality everywhere, Canada, the U.S., Europe. Um, that's not going to change. So I actually don't think you're going to have an easier time raising capital in the U S. Um, you know, again, you know, unless you otherwise, you know, are targeting a very specific type of investor in a very specific industry where we just don't have that sort of support in Canada, that would be, you know, an exception I could think of, but certainly during COVID, uh, it is going to be very similar uh, behavior between Canada and the U S. Have you seen much difference at all? I, I'm sure you don't even have time to do this, but have you seen much difference in how uh, the VC community is, has acted since March um, in the United States versus the VC community here in Canada? Uh, so ag again, I haven't seen really, you know, when COVID first hit, for sure investors were like, you know, and this would have been for a very short period of time, Batten down the hatches and kind of focused on their portfolio. And, and, and that's not from a deployment of capital perspective, but that's just from a manpower perspective, just because a whole bunch of things were, were, were spun around, right? And so you need to kind of deal with, 
your family first. And, and I think that's what folks did, you know, but ultimately, you know, I've got portfolio companies that are taking external capital, competitive situations, and that external capital was both from the US and Canada. And so the Canadian VCs I've talked to are all writing checks and they're continuing to do that. They're continuing to look at deals. I'd say in the very early days of COVID though, for sure, you know, everybody was spun around and they had to focus in on their, on their immediate portfolio from a, from a human capital perspective for a while. Yeah, but they're still looking to do new deals. So given the number of years that you've been part of this global ecosystem, because this isn't really, um, you know, just Canada right now, it's not just the Valley, it's, it's Israel, it's been Singapore, it's been London. Um, are there people in the ecosystem that you look to for guidance that if they write something, you read it like Andreessen Mark just came out with a great piece recently. Ben Horowitz. Like, are there people that you look to and, and, and really look forward to reading their stuff? Yeah, I think, I think there's a lot and I think everyone's going to be a little bit different, right? So there's, you know, again, um, you know, and I know some of these individuals, so, so it's been good, but certainly any of the large VCs, whether it's, you know, Andreessen, whether it's Bessemer, they do a lot of really good stuff. Um, you know, David Scott historically at Matrix, like there's a lot of stuff that's out there that, that we all read as VCs. We all tend to read very similar things. And so, um, you know, Redpoint, et cetera. And so a lot of this stuff is just, again, it is all interesting and, and, and they tend to be the folks that, you know, think about things a little bit different and try to push the boundaries a bit and, and actually, um, you know, come up with ways to evaluate companies different and then share that with everybody else. Great learning experiences for all of us. Yeah. I mean, listen, I, I'm with you. I, I, I'm just so impressed with so much intellectual firepower that is being poured into innovation and entrepreneurship and really supporting this. I mean, when you look out the next 10 years with artificial intelligence and the massive growth there, quantum computing, what are some of the things, what are some of the trends that you see that make you most excited about and that you would want to align yourself with personally? And then also perhaps, even though you're kind of new at RBC, from a, an RBC standpoint. Yeah, so, so I'll, I'll definitely speak about it personally because it's, it's two months in, so it's probably a little early to talk about it from an RBC perspective. But, you know, certainly, you know, areas of interest for sure, um, and this, this would carry over from my, my venture days as well, you know, the healthcare space I'm, I'm fascinated by, and I think there's a lot of really good things there. And, and when I talk about healthcare, I, I loop in life sciences as well. Um, so, you know genetically modified diseases, kind of all the stuff that we're going through with COVID, the treatments for this, you know, uh, personal medications, personal treatments, uh, you know, all the stuff that the big hospitals are doing, you know, um, all the way down to, you know, how are we taking care of ourselves and the organizations that are helping us do that. So that whole spectrum of digital therapeutics, you know, all the way through to, you know, hospital platforms that are enabling them to, um, you know, take more throughput. All of that is interesting to me because I do think that as a society, we are far more focused on healthcare now than we were five, 10 years ago, for sure. And so I do think that that's going to be a booming sector. Um, and so that's really interesting to me. Quantum's interesting as well. So I did a quantum deal uh, when I was at Omer's Ventures. Super excited about that and, and the possibilities that uh, that ultimately opens up you know, a whole number of areas, right? Whether that be, you know, genetics or AI or what have you, you know, once we get to the point where we've got a working quantum chip, you know, the world opens up significantly in terms of the problems that we'll be able to solve. And so I think that has relevance for financial institutions, you know, you know, advanced material companies, like there's probably not a lot of organizations that wouldn't be touched by something like that. And so those would be two areas that jump, jump to mind that would be really interesting. Here's one other thought, AR, VR, holographics. Now that people are getting so into to Zoom and Google yeah. Hangouts and whatnot, what about bringing the, the, a more real life experience, almost like you're in the room, like yeah. King, Kinsman, um, you know, having that experience and that, and that technology, because there's some great companies here in Canada that are developing it. 
there's a lot of great companies here in Canada. And uh, you know what? And again, this is just a personal view. Uh, I actually would not be too bullish on that myself. I, like, I don't know about you, but like, I'm dying not to have a Zoom call with you, but to go out and actually meet you in person. The last thing I want to do is get into a VR room with you. Um, I just, I just think, you know, if anything, this is highlighted that we're social beings and we need to have some sort of social interaction. And, you know, again, I'm even, I'm even seeing it with my kids, right? Like they're, the last thing they want to do is, is play Fortnite for 15 hours. Like they will do it for a bit and then they'll get out of it and they'll want to have some sort of social interaction. So I actually don't know if AR VR is going to be well served by the pandemic, to be honest. And you know, I think Zoom has done an amazing job in terms of facilitating what we're doing now. I think amazing. I think they've done a fantastic job. And I think, you know, the backgrounds that we can put on and all these sorts of things are awesome. You know, but I do think that there's an element when you take it to the next level where you're really going to be independent by yourself with a VR headset on. Uh, I'm actually not convinced that that's going to be the way the market moves post, uh, post COVID. So as you have, as we've all lived through this um, rather unique time in human history, is there a trend or there a couple of trends that you see that as a result of this experience that will get traction, that will be part of our life going forward? Yeah, and again, we've kind of harped on it a little bit. I think for sure the organizations that are dealing with wellness, for sure, health, um, you know, those obviously we're dealing with a, with a global health pand pandemic. So, um, those are going to be more and more relevant as we move forward. I do think though that, you know, again, you know, any application that's decentralizing the workplace, I think is going to be really interesting, um, because we've had to, we've had to deal with it. I don't think this is going to be, you know, at least for me and I'll, I'll use myself and my friends. Like none of us want to spend the rest of our lives doing business on Zoom. Um, but could we do this for a day a week? Absolutely. And does that change a lot of things? No question about it. I'm actually really curious to see what happens to the commercial real estate market post COVID, right? And not because businesses are going out of, or not because uh, companies are going out of business, but more because just the way we're, the way we've been forced to operate during COVID you know, there's going to be elements of that, I believe, that translate into the everyday pre-COVID working life. And, you know, that has to have some sort of an impact on a, on a, on a corporate uh, real estate front. Yeah, and, and commuting, right? I mean, you live well, yeah, in... Yeah, absolutely. Be, right? That's going to be a big... It's going to play a, a big role. Yeah. Uh, one, one last question, then I want to kind of tie it off. Um, this is from Galen Sprout. Do you expect consumer behavior resulting from the pan pandemic to keep up after the pandemic, does this affect how you evaluate an investment opportunity? Yeah, uh, good question. I mean, um, I actually don't know, to be honest, how consumer behavior has changed all that much because the only consumers I deal with right now on a day-to-day -day basis are, are the, the four people that live in this house. Um, and so, you know, I think that's probably a TBD for me, to be absolutely honest, because I think you know, again, you know, are we online more for sure? Um, are we kind of being sick of being online more? At least what I have seen, yes. I, I don't know how long this is going to take to to translate into a new normal, whatever that looks like. And so, you know, not a great answer to that question. But I, but in all honesty, I actually don't know, just because unfortunately, my my uh, my scope of view has been rather limited for the last you know month and a half. Um, the flaws with the flaws uh, being exposed in the system of traditional work hours as the primary way to circulate spending power are banks being more open to startups that are focused on digital currencies. So at this point, again, I, I can't speak for the bank as a whole, just because I'm not as integrated, um, you know, a month and a half in as, as I otherwise would be. So it's tough for me to speak to the bank as a whole. I'm guessing at this point, again, because we're literally, you know, all we're focused on is trying to make sure that, you know, consumers and businesses, you know, survive COVID. Um, I'm guessing this isn't something that we're, you know, singularly focused on at the moment, but um, 
so a tough one, tough one for me to answer just given, you know, my infancy in the organization. No, no, no. Listen, that's awesome. And, and I, I think asking you too many questions about RBC this early into your tenure is, is probably offside. So I apologize. That's my fault. No, no, no worries. I, I do want to, I want to wrap it up. I want everybody to know that this has been recorded. It will be available on our next YouTube channel. Um, we do want to encourage, because we know that it's such a busy time of day um, and, and any time of day during a crisis, um, during you know, traditional work hours, it's, it's hard. Um, but I think that you have uh, brought really good light to some of the darker questions out there, shared some really important thoughts, given people some hope. Um, is there one final thought that you'd like to leave the group with um, as it pertains to coming out of a crisis and into um, a, a, an environment where there is more normalcy and growth and, and a stronger economy? Yeah, I, I think the only thing I would want to share, and I think I reiterated this before, uh, is transparency, right? Be transparent with your entire teams, your entire organization. They will help you think creatively in terms of solutions to help you get through this period of time and then ultimately put you in a position where you're not going to be hindered when, when things do turn around and you'll be able to, to escalate and get up the curve a lot faster than you otherwise would have. Perfect. Listen, thank you. And thank, thank you all for being part of this. Um, we are really doing the very, very best that we can at Next to support our alumni, to support our cohorts, to support our friends and our partners, because um, the more that we can bring intelligent uh, discussion like this and, and really answer some of the uh, more challenging questions that you're all faced with, um, the better we're all going to be as a community, the better we're all going to be as part of our country. Um, I think we all have to feel very, very uh, good and very positive about the way um, leadership in this country, um, corporate leadership, political leadership have brought Canadians together in this time of crisis. And, and as you're starting, as you've been seeing, there are a lot of people within the communities that are really doing the very best that they can to reach out and support um, others. And that's what today is. So again, thank you so much, Sid. Congratulations on your new role. Thank you for all that you've done uh, for the ecosystem and the startup community and all the years that you've been part of it. And, and again, to all of you, thank you for being with us. And we'll look forward to seeing you. In fact, I think we've got a fireside chat with M Michelle Scarborough next week. Uh, from BDC, and she is, well, as you know, a rock star and, and somebody that uh, I'm looking forward to having a discussion similar to this uh, with and, and sharing those thoughts and ideas. So thank you all very much again, and uh, uh, good luck, and, and, and stay happy, stay healthy through uh, this pandemic. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.